Radio Free Santa Clarita presents The Talk of Santa Clarita A podcast about issues involving Santa Clarita and the surrounding valley Episode 141 Hollywood manager and Santa Clarita Valley resident Joe Williamson and actor Vita Gaffari And now, let's see what the Talk of Santa Clarita is. And remember, this is for posterity, so be honest. Okay, thanks guys for uh, being here today. Um, We have uh, Joe Williamson, manager and resident of Santa Clarita Valley. And uh, Vita Kafari, right? I got yes, it right. Yes, you that, got it right. I, all right. And that, um, what is the origin of the of Kafari and, and Vita? Is that those are kind of unique names? Well, I guess we do have an hour. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know, my family is of Persian heritage. Okay. And Kafari is actually a very old Persian name. It's like Smith and Farsi, mm-hmm. and I come from a very old Persian tribe, the Gafir tribe, which now is Kafari. So there's still a lot of Gafaris, you know, in the Middle East and. Mm-hmm. I'm proud to be a Southern California Gafari, so um, yeah. Uh, it's funny, uh, uh, when Joe sent me your bio and, and it said of Persian descent, I, the first thing I expected was you were going to have an accent. And, you know, oh, yeah, like yeah, I'm yeah. going to talk like this. Yes. Yeah. Well, that's more Russian. <laughs> <laughs> so. so, and, and uh, Joe, you are the, uh, Vita's manager, right? And you run your own management company out, out here in San Clarita, or do you, are you, and, uh, do you commute? I, I commute, but I do a lot of it out here. Um, I'm the manager. I'm also Vita's uh, publicist as well, mm-hmm. and also I do uh, a little bit producing on films as well. Yeah, you are uh, a, a kind of a, a, man, a jack of all trades, aren't you? When you do your thing, right? He wears many hats. Exactly. In this yeah. town, you have to wear many hats to get things done. It seems like. How long? Have, how long have you been a manager? Uh, I'd say since 2014, I'd say. Since mm-hmm. 2014, yeah, around there. What were you doing before then? Um, I was just a businessman. And, and you just jumped into it? or? Well, what happened, well, basically, yeah, I, uh, uh, I always was a fan of the classics, you mm-hmm. know, and I love a, a, a big movie buff, and um, I was a big fan of The Rifleman, and mm-hmm. I, I knew a friend who knew uh, Chuck Connors' son, The Rifleman, uh, Jeff Connors, mm-hmm. and he, he arranged for us to meet, and he said, you know, you should get into the business. And he always wanted me to manage, and you know, you'd be great at it. And and so I one day decided to give it a shot, and uh, I became a natural and fell in love with it. Yeah, yeah. Well, you do. I, and and I I say this because I am one as well. But you strike me as a movie geek. Yes, I am. <laughs> yes, I am. And it, it, it's funny. For years, I was always a movie geek, the movie nerd, right, right. what have you. But now it's now I can get away with it because it's part of my business. Yeah. But I am known as kind of like a movie buff and all that. Honey, it's work. It's work. I swear I've got to watch this movie. It's work. It, exactly. It's my job, you know, to watch all my clients' films. Yeah. And, and uh, uh, but it, it, like I said, I'm very blessed. And um, and like I said, it just. Uh, uh, you know, lucky to be where I'm at and what I'm doing. It's yeah, a, it's a lot of hard work sometimes, blood, sweat, and tears, but it pays off when, you know, when you get a project completed and gets released, and you know, yeah. and it does well or not. Well, I think a lot of people are, like, they assume a manager is an agent. Mm-hmm. You know, mm-hmm. um, and there's a radical difference in a lot of ways. Would you say? Or? A big difference, and I've, uh, you know, I've heard people say, "Oh, I want you to be my agent," and they, they, I've been called agent several times, and I always have to correct them and say, um, there's, "I'm sorry, I'm not an agent. Mm-hmm. I'm a manager. I don't mm-hmm. do, you know, I, uh, I don't have an agency." There's, you know, there's a big difference between the two. You know, mm-hmm. like the agents get the breakdowns and different things like that. Yeah. Why a manager does not. Yeah. And, uh, but yeah, you're right. And I, I've had to correct. Uh, you know, I, I don't mean to be snobby or anything, but I always have to say, no, 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 I'm a, a manager, not no, agent, but, because then I'll get in trouble too. Because yet, yeah, they you have know. they have the ATA board. They have mm-hmm. there's all sorts of things with SAG after. It's just completely different. And, and just so people know, it's like a, it was like a, I don't know, like a, it's kind of a loophole in a way because they became a situation uh, years ago where a, they. Decided agents could not produce pictures or have their names on yes. pictures. So managers kind of evolved out of that because they can produce and manage and, and work with you know actors and help package deals at the same time. So it's a little bit of a loophole. But the, I think the big difference is really that the, the way I always I used to work for managers. So, uh, but the the way I used to explain it to people is that the. Uh, uh, an agent might have a client for a year, two years, three years before they jump to another agency or whatever, but a manager might have somebody 
for 22 years. Mm -hmm. You know, it's a long-term investment on something, right? I mean, would you is would you say that something? Or, 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 or am I wrong on that? Or? With me, you're 100% right. I, uh, uh, most of my clients have had for several years, mm -hmm. and uh, you know, so it's just it's just it's pretty much the same group. Yeah, and Vita is one of your clients. Yes, very <laughs> lucky to be one of his clients. He's he's a great represent representation. It's wonderful mm. to have him represent you because a lot of times I think actors get lost in the shuffle. Yeah. And with agents it's always about the next audition. Whereas with managers it's more about building your career like every and time. Strategizing I, for exactly. It, yeah. So every time I get a party it's like, well how is this gonna help you in the long run as mm. opposed to it being a paycheck or as opposed to it being something you put on your reel or as opposed right. to just standing out on IMDB it's like looking at the big picture. Which right, is quite right. nice. And yeah. you know he has a business background right. so it's very helpful. Well yeah, I, I think another great example would be uh, Johnny Depp's career who mm. for years did a lot of indie stuff by choice and his manager was directing him toward that stuff and um, you know then it ultimately turned to what he did with uh, Pirates of Caribbean and things um, but um, and and uh, the, I, you're from Maryland right? Is yeah that, born in DC raised in Maryland. Yeah, yes. Okay mm -hmm. and it, it, do you always want to be an actor? Or? Yeah you know I was a journalist back east because I think in DC you have to be either a politician or you talk about mm, politicians yeah, or you're yeah. a lawyer or a lobbyist but I minored in theater at University of Maryland, and the okay. interesting thing about that is everything comes back full circle. The guy that built the black box theater that I performed in mm -hmm. at University of Maryland runs the SAG after conservatory, Carl mm -hmm. Warren. So one of the first things I did when I joined SAG was I joined the conservatory, and then it was this guy. He's like, "Oh my God, you're a terp!" So it's it's nice knowing that. And, and University of Maryland, believe it or not, has a very strong alumni. Mm -hmm. So it's you know it's it's great. You know they have lots of events and, and all sorts of things. And I'm like, well. They're always trying to compete with Syracuse. I'm like, well, why don't you guys do showcases, or why don't you do this, or why right. don't they just spend their money in like ridiculous other ways? Mm. <laughs> They're really into crab, of course. Right, right. So we yeah. have like these big crab fests, and they, you know, ship the crab from Maryland, and but you know, it, it, I'm like, well, why don't you just do industry showcases, or why don't you do right, like right. there's like two big casting directors that went to University of Maryland. No such luck. So. Um, I come from there originally, but what I did out here was I worked for some TV stations, and since I'm Persian, mm -hmm. I would work for some Persian TV stations, mm -hmm. and they're broadcast internationally. I work for like the three really big ones. One of them is ATV, another one of them is Gen TV. These mm -hmm. were really big stations, and it, you know, broadcast everywhere. And just as a journalist, I mean, not just uh, as a journalist. Well, I had like a, I would cover like red carpets. Oh, okay. So I had like my own shows mm -hmm. and it was quite nice I would do the work in English and Farsi and it was quite nice because they say I said that I would do twice the work and uh, half the amount of pay because you know it's in different languages right, yeah. so and then I had another show where it's like um, I on LA where I would go to like the Getty Museum and uh, it was it was a wonderful experience and I you know I got to meet a lot of people but the cool thing is one of my editors really liked my voice mm -hmm. and he's like why don't you do promos so I do the promos in Farsi and English and mm -hmm. once again twice the work for half the pay right. but it was great preparation and then he he put me in touch with a friend of his that had a studio and then he's like you know I'll put something together for you I mean it's not professional but then I was like you know what I'll start taking classes I started taking voiceover classes and the voiceover bled into the acting and I started doing more voiceover and more acting I actually did promos for a little while and that's very rare for women to do promos mm -hmm. I've done commercial narration industrials as I said I've done animation so that was a great experience, but you know, also seguing into on camera was quite nice as yeah, well. Yeah. So what what kind of work have you done? I was looking over your I, your IMDb page. You, uh, how how long have you been acting now? Is it has been? Oh, quite a while. Yeah. Um, I've been doing this. Gosh, I want to say since the early 2000s. Yeah. But I will tell you that I did take a lot of time to do the journalism. Yeah. So I would go back to the journalism. Like they'd offer mm -hmm. me this great job. One guy said, you know, one studio. Uh, manager or general manager said you know I'll give you two shows and mm -hmm. I was like I'll work around your schedule and I was like okay well I can't turn this down I have two shows on right. the network like yeah. how would that happen in like the real world yeah so I and we had pretty good budgets we had like you know hair and makeup so it was it was quite nice like when I would do big events we had a hair right. and makeup so um, it was a great experience but you know I would also do acting but I think when Tides have shifted uh, mm -hmm. with uh, Persian television, and it became a very political thing. Right. So then I was luckily glad and able to pursue my acting career more. So mm -hmm. I've been doing a lot more acting, you know, over the recent years, and it's great having great representation. Yeah. So, Joe, now you, I was looking at, at some of your uh, projects that you've been involved with, and some of the actors that uh, um, 
You, you do a lot of indie stuff, a lot of horror stuff in general, or uh, um, yeah, it's I'd say it's more, I, I do a mixture of uh, I do some <coughs> uh, uh, action films. Like one of them was Checkpoint, what I mentioned to you earlier. Mm. It's a, a action film on Netflix right now. It's mm. with uh, William Forsythe, Bill Goldberg, and that. And then Samurai Cop Two: Deadly Vengeance, which was a action film as well. <coughs> with uh, the Tom, then famous Tommy Wise and then also uh, uh, Bai Ling of the Crow fame and then yeah, yeah. You know, Novak and that but <coughs> uh, it seems like it's mo- uh, a lot large part of it is horror that's true you're right yeah. do, you, do you find that uh, and, and this question is to you as well Vita do you find that um, once you do like a certain genre that they kind of you can get wedged into doing that uh, I mean uh, you know you know what I mean like if you do like for a while, Jamie Lee Curtis was only doing horror slasher yes. films. You know what I mean? Uh, you know, uh, d- 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 by doing horror and action films, does that prevent you from doing, say, you know, your dr- uh, Driving Miss Daisy or whatever? <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, it's sometimes you do get typecast. I remember like Vincent Price, he used mm-hmm. to he'd go crazy when he'd always want to talk about his other stuff and that. Or Basil Vapen was another one. Yeah. You know, he, he didn't want to talk about Son of Frankenstein. He said, I'd rather talk about my uh, uh, portray of uh, Sir Richard III in Tower yeah. of London. Yeah. But uh, yeah, you do get typecast. Yeah. And, and it does make it a little bit more challenging. I know one filmmaker and uh, the distributors, oh, you're just a horror guy, mm-hmm. you know, and, and you do, like I said, it's, it can be challenging at times. Yeah, yeah. What, what about you, Vita? Do you find that's a, a challenge, or do you just, I mean, how do you approach uh, accepting roles? I mean, do you worry about that as far as uh, stereotyping or ca- uh, cast typing or... You know, I find that in horror, there's a lot of opportunities for women. Mm-hmm. The characters are very well fleshed out. So yeah. for me, I think it, if I really want it to be a deterrent, it can be a deterrent. But there's so many different subgenres of horror now. Like mm-hmm. Joe said, I just did my first, you know, creature feature. Mm-hmm. I did that franchise. There's, you know, there's different levels of horror. There was a horror film I did that I was, you know, it was an exorcism horror. There's just so many different branches of horror. There and there's so much now. But I, I don't really think that's the case because the film that I'm working on now right. and it's going to be premiering next week is more of a thriller film so you know there's there's like a drama aspect to it there's a thriller aspect to it there's a sci-fi aspect to it so I think there's just different genres and subgenres. Yeah, I yeah. think it's allowed us the indie world has allowed us that privilege that you can yeah. have you know more genres. Do you find? I mean, you've you've done a lot of. You mentioned to me you've worked with people like Mindy Kaling and and some other uh, uh, top no, uh, top notch up up at the top level of uh, Hollywood actors and actresses. Um, do you find that the indie world is more fun or uh, more challenging or just something that you do? Um, you, you know what I mean? It's like there there's definite tier level when you're working on an indie project sure. versus, you know, a, you know, Warner Brothers motion pictures major, you know, or like film. working on a pilot, there's so yeah. many like hooks in the kitchen, just right, down right. to like the wardrobe you're wearing, like right. working on that show was like in- insane, but in a good way. Mm-hmm. But I think um, with indie film, like, like I said, like the female characters are much stronger right? and you're not just in there for like one episode or two mm-hmm. episodes, it's fully fleshed out. And right. I like that. And yeah, it's independent, but you really build a sense of community with indie film mm-hmm. that when you're on a TV set, it's just a different thing. You know, like just to do one scene, it takes a million years, it feels like. Right. And it's not as fresh and it's not as tangible as working on an independent film as you really get to like explore the character, explore the journey. You know, you really get to know the people you're working with because it's such an intense thing. It's just a different process. That, that is such a nice way of saying there's no craft service. <laughs> well, there is something. I mean, it's not like, you know, it's not like a Gelson's craft service, yeah. but it's, there, there's definitely something. Well, one thing, too, I like think. Like Vaughn's, maybe. Yeah, okay. <laughs> uh, 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 um, one thing I think, a big, uh, another thing, too, is like a lot of producers. They feel there's more control in mm-hmm. filmmakers and writers yes. in the indie world. Because I know, like, Larry Cohen, for instance, who did the It's a Lie films and the Yeah, 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 yeah. Films. okay. He used to do a lot of television, mm-hmm. but he, and uh, he was he was tired of his scripts being butchered mm-hmm. by uh, uh, you know the studios and there was that many gatekeepers. So he produced some of his own films, which like uh, Black Caesar with Fred the Hammer Williamson, which did quite well. Mm-hmm. And Joe Dante was another one. He uh, he started out doing indie films like Piranha, yeah. with Roger Corman and The Howling and so forth. He went to big studio movies like Gremlins yeah, yeah, yeah. and uh, 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 The Burbs with Tom Hanks. Yeah, and, and, and actually Joe Dante directed one of my favorite, most 
it was like 20 years old, but it's so timely now. Uh, a film for Cinemax called uh, uh, The Second Civil War. Oh, I've never seen that. I have to see that now. It's, uh, it's fascinating because it talks about uh, immigration being what causes... Interesting. Uh, so ahead of his time. Yeah, it, it, frighteningly so. Uh, it, you watch it now and you just go, wow, this is literally happening now. And this was a comedy when it came out. Wow. So, uh, but you got Joe Dante, great director. I didn't mean to... No, you know, it's quite all right. But now he's back doing... The, uh, you know, he did all the big studio movies. Like mm. I said, like the Looney Tune movies and... Yeah. Verbs, Tom Hanks. Now he's back to doing independent films where he yeah. has more control. He just did one, what was it called? Nightmare of Cinema, I think it was called. A horror anthology with some other horror directors. And Mickey Rourke was in it and Richard Chamberlain. But yeah. yeah, some of them, they have more control. And that's why they, like, one thing about the independent, it allows their artistic uh, view to get, get out more. Because a lot of times the big studios and that, they just butcher their view in that. And there's so many gatekeepers and, you know, it just... Uh, I, I kind of wondered, because it, it seemed like... Joe Dante, kind of, not to say that he's not working, but it's, I hadn't really heard of any of his projects recently, or that it seemed like he had stopped working for a while, so. But he's in the indie world again. In the indie world, yeah. Do you find, I mean, but it's interesting that you bring up about, and, and again, this is for you as well, Vita, but mm -hmm. particularly in the last five years, but when you've gotten, gotten into the business, things have changed radically. So much. Yeah. And um, social media adds to it, too. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it. Mm -hmm. it, it the, the, uh, a good friend of mine is, is the head of development over at uh, Bruckheimer, uh, and and you know I talked to him about you know trying to make it in the industry now, and he talks about you know what what's what projects have you done uh, you know independently you know what's on YouTube you know do you have a following on that kind of stuff and uh, um, you know it, it, but you know that before it used to be just you have a good script you know what mm -hmm. I mean um, I, I, but it seems to me like you know particularly in the indie world there was mm -hmm. always uh, you know, a VH, uh, VHS, I'm dating myself, but you know, there was... Hey, I remember the betas. Yeah, the betas, okay. <laughs> the video, the video market, you could always go direct to video or something, or the drive-ins even, you know, like with the old, mm -hmm. uh, uh, um, I don't know, what did they, what, what is, I'm struggling for the term. Um, Grind but, movies? Uh, what, did, what, did, what did the Tarantino film that he did with Robert, Robert, Robert Rodriguez? Um, From Dust Till Dawn? No, 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 uh, it was like a, Oh, never mind. <laughs> uh, this man is like a human IMDb, much like the, the you one, probably are. Yeah, so planet, probably planet, uh, it was the two parts. Oh, Kurt Russell was yes. in it, yes. And Sybil Donning uh, did one of the clips. I think I, I know Death Proof, I think it was called. Yeah, but it was combined together. It was called... Um, Exploitation or... or, or so, yeah, but it was I based on the... Yeah. We're getting off on a tangent. Gotta have a movie Grindhouse movies. Night. Grindhouse movies. Yeah. That's the term I'm looking for. Thank you. Uh, yeah, they, there was the Grindhouse movie uh, audience as well. Um... But all that's kind of disappeared now. But on the other end of it, there's streaming with Netflix and Hulu and Amazon, and, and it seems like Netflix will just, you know, amp buy anything these days. Yeah. Um, I sent them clips of my kid, you know, uh, eating porridge, and they there bought it. There you go. They bought it. Yeah. Uh, it's, it's available on Netflix next week. There you go. Uh, Can't wait to see the promos. <laughs> <laughs> has has the nature of the business changed as far as like how you approach putting together an indie film now, or? There's uh. uh there's st so many platforms now, you know, like mm -hmm. Redbox is another one, Netflix, yeah. like you said, and that, and then Amazon, of course, and, mm -hmm. and, and, and all some different digital uh, platforms and that. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, so there is a lot of areas to go to in that. Mm -hmm. And uh, the distributors, one thing that they're really into is the IMD ranking. You mm -hmm. know, they'll say, oh, this person here, he's, he has no value, or, you mm -hmm. know, if they're under 5,000 or something like that. And uh, uh, so there's, you know, different things like the distributors recommend and suggest and stuff. And how you promote things. And, and how you promote things and so forth, too. But one thing about the independent films is there's a lot more freedom, you know, because with the big studios, you saying how, you know, you just had a good script. Nowadays, with the big studios, it's just they want to do Marvel movies or yeah. just remakes. They want pack, they, and, or they want to package completely before they even decide if they're going to greenline it. Exactly. Yeah. Just, it's just a, a reboot of a franchise. It's, a, it's almost... Why with the independent films, there's much more freedom to get things done. And mm -hmm. uh, but yeah, instead of the drive-ins now, they have Amazon Prime and mm -hmm. Amazon Video and, and Netflix and, and Redbox and what have you. You know, some of the other ones, the YouTube Red now and all the other ones. Oh. Some, Where do you get your financing for your films? It, it depends. It, yeah. uh, 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 like I said, there's different executive producers out there, and, yeah. and uh, it just it just depends. Yeah. Um, it, it's a business like everything else. They like to know what was your last film, right? How did it do? Yeah. You know, uh, did it make a profit? You know, these different things. I know um, that's very important. I know one producer, a director, 
and it seemed like he'd burn every bridge he went to. Like uh, there was one project he got fired on, yeah. and then they had to basically re-edit it and mm-hmm. get somebody else. And then there was another project he did, and he uh, uh, when he was supposed to have it edited and stuff, he he was in, even returning the money person's phone calls and his texts. And, yeah, it sounds was like, like you're describing Ed Norton. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> and, and no, it, 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 it's amazing to all the find other uh, people for finances, and then there's mm-hmm. some of these, uh, you know, some of these filmmakers. I guess they just end up finding these uh, some of these uh, distributors and that, and they just want it done cheap, and they're just looking for filler. How fast you can get it done? How right, cheap? Right. They don't even pay for a trailer, you mm-hmm. know, and they just shoot it out there. Yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. but um, there's ones like that too. The, um, what, oh, Vita, is for you, I mean, as an actress in, in, in the last five years, how, how has the industry changed for you? I mean, it seems like... Gosh, you know, so you many could, ways. I mean, I, yeah, I mean, just, it seems, as, as somebody who used to try and make it in the industry as a writer, I I look at it now like I go, well, I should get back into it because there's so much out there. It, it seems it like is. it'd be impossible not to get a job. Yeah. Uh, but, I mean, I know it's not the case, but... Uh, I mean, do you find it's it's harder or easier to 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 find work and and and, and, and using social media is that necessary to? You know, I will tell you. Well, having great representation helps, mm-hmm. but I think also people seek people more out online. Like um, mm-hmm. people have offered me stuff, uh, roles, all sorts of things. Mm-hmm. Be it on camera, be it voiceover, be it anything. It's uh, much more accessible. Mm-hmm. There is a lot more out there, though, and there's a lot more to sift through. Right. But I feel like, yeah, the tide has turned. I think it's not the standard way of doing things. I think there's been such a shift in the industry, and so many things have changed. And it's changed in terms of casting with the casting directors and self-taping. Mm-hmm. That a lot of people just, you know, a lot of producers, they just put post notices up because casting directors they don't need to have an office they just do the self tapes now so it's really revolutionized things for me so instead of you know driving around town Mm -hmm. even for big stuff you're self taping you know you I go to a friend's studio once in a while I'll do it at home but it's just totally shifted and you just send the tape in or the the file in and you send the file in I like to go to like I have a friend who has a professional studio and I like to record it there and we have a good rhythm with each other Mm -hmm. so yeah, but it's uh, even for television, you know, for feature films, self tape, self tape. So it's really, you know, radical. A friend of mine was telling me that they had an audition for This Is Us, which is a major network sure, show. Sure, yeah, yeah. And they had to self tape themselves. Hmm. So I thought that was very interesting. Yeah, uh, well, I, my experience with casting directors is that they want to do the least amount of work as possible. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I don't know. I think it depends See, on See, I can say that because I'm not an actor. Oh, right, right, right. <laughs> But um, and and uh, what, what kind of genre do you prefer to work in? Do you, uh, do you have a preferred? You said the horror con- uh, horror films in general are, are very um, uh, g- generous with the women's roles. So. Yeah, you know, I really I have to say, except for getting bloody, I really like horror, and I feel like the most compelling roles I've played in are, are horror and sci-fi. Like lately, I've played scientists. Mm-hmm. This is my I just had my third scientist role, and my dad was a very well known scientist or in scientist, excuse me. He was a very, in in those cultures, scientists are and and mathematicians are like Michael Jordan mm-hmm. or <clears throat> Kobe Bryant. So right. my dad was just very renowned. You know, they they. I remember I saw I was going through old pictures and my dad was like there was like a he was a professor emeritus at the University of Tehran, which is kind of like being professor emeritus at like UCLA. Mm-hmm. And they had like they were all sitting down and beneath them they were like in their regalia. There was like this really nice Persian rug. <laughs> and like there was like, you know, like fancy dancy people there. I mean, I don't even think Kobe Ryan, Kobe Bryant like Mm-hmm. sits on a like you know his chair is like on a Persian rug so my point in telling you this is not to gloat but they were treated very special right, right. so for me to play a scientist it, it has a very personal meaning for me mm-hmm. and uh, the first role I played a scientist in was Eternal Code which is premiering next week at the Chinese theater we're very gonna, yeah, excited I was going to talk about that yeah absolutely <clears throat> so I was really over the moon to play a scientist in that one and you know that's not a typical role that a woman plays and she wasn't like a square scientist she had a compelling story and she definitely had her own M. Mm -hmm. So that was quite exciting to play, and I'm very grateful to the fabulous uh, multi-award winning Harley Wallen for the opportunity, and it was great to work on that film. We had amazing actors. We had 
uh, Richard Tyson, you know, from Kindergarten Cop, Scout yeah. Taylor Compton from Zob Z Rob Zombie's Halloween 1 and 2, Billy Worth from The Lost Boys, uh, Katie Wallen from Betrayed opposite John Savage, Jan Birch from Wes Craven's The People Under the Stairs, and of course, the legendary actor Mel Novak from Bruce mm -hmm. Lee's Game of Death. And mm -hmm. it was just an amazing, amazing cast, and I felt very honored to be a part of it. And uh, it was just a wonderful ensemble. Wasn't uh, Richard Tyson... Um wasn't he Buddy Ravel in Three O Five? Yes, he was. I love Buddy Ravel. I would call him Buddy Ravel when I met him on set the first time. I said, "Well, well, well, if it isn't Buddy Ravel, oh, oh he beat me up." And he was like laughing, and he's like, "That's hilarious." So, he, he was great in that part. He's a wonderful actor and and a very generous actor. And I will say, in between takes, he was like. We heard, we reciting Shakespearean sonnets for really? the cast and crew. So yeah. he's a, a ma marvelous actor. I think he has an MFA from an Ivy League school. I believe it's Columbia University. Yeah. So he is just, you know, he's not just Buddy Ravel. He's yeah. just an amazing Shakespearean actor. That was a pretty famous actor. role and pretty yeah. famous film. I love that movie too. Yeah, I love that movie too. I, I, re I recently, not to get off on a tangent of it, but I, I recently watched it again. And it, I love uh, the library scene. The library scene's great. <laughs> yeah. all, all, all of it. Yeah, but the, it does have the scene where he seduces a teacher. And yes, <laughs> yes. That could never get made today. No, no it's no. too PC, too yeah. PC. But so, I, I, we're being told to lower our volume oh, a little bit. Oh, <laughs> sorry. Sorry. That's okay. Because we're so excited about Richard Tyson. No, but it's, <laughs> there's so many movies where it's made and go, you know, over the years and they just disappear and disappear, you know. Mm -hmm. And that's a thousands. classic. That's, a that's one classic. of the few ones which just stick around and become famous. Yeah, Phil Janowa film. Uh, I believe it's how you pronounce the same, Janowa. Um, who, I don't know what he's doing these days, but... Uh, <laughs> Do you know? You're the you're the film geek. That one there, unfortunately, I'm not. Uh, I know he did the Rattle and Hum, the YouTube film, and uh, and uh, uh, a gangster film that came out right after, right when Miller's Crossing came out, the Coen oh. Brothers film. So it kind of got killed in the box office. But I haven't heard from him since. And and I think Three O'clock High really shows that he knew really how to move a camera. You Definitely. Know? Yeah. Yeah, yeah so. just the anticipation for three o'clock. Yeah, yeah, it's yeah. A, it's a really well done film. So it's some of these filmmakers. It's hard to see what happens in them. You know, they they do some famous films mm -hmm. and then they just it's a tough business. Yeah, I mean, like Steve Gar Carver. I don't know if you recognize the name. He did some famous movies. He did uh, An Eye for an Eye with Chuck Norris and Mel. Yeah, yeah. He also did Lone Wolf McCade mm -hmm. with Chuck Norris and David sure. Carradine, yeah. which is one of my favorite classics. And he did a couple other films, and they just disappeared you yeah. know just uh, and then when it is something else it's like I said it's hard to uh, you know keep out there like that so yeah. sometimes these filmmakers I guess they get burnt out yeah yeah I mean I do you think there's a secret to longevity Pina? I think you have to adjust to stuff I'm a very old school person I had a very elderly father I think just you know being able to self tape once in a while because yeah. I remember I had something during the holidays and my little studio set up the guy was out of town. I'm like, oh, I better record this myself. So I think an actor or a filmmaker or anybody, you've got to be industrious. You've got to use social media. You've got yeah. to put yourself out there. Um, I will say there's even a lot on Instagram, on Twitter. There's just so much. It's like yeah. people find me there. And uh, it's it's interesting how it goes about. But you've got to be you got to be up on this stuff. you got to constantly... Um, and reinvent you know, yourself. You constantly have something out there, and then it has to be blasted all over the place. I know yeah. Joe Dante, he d spends a fortune on uh, uh, press releases on every single project he does, and just, you know, he's... You know, it's an investment it in yourself. Exactly. Yeah. This business, you have to do that, you know? Yeah. And um, that's, you know, that's... They just try and keep... That's like Tom Holland. I don't know if you remember him from Child's Play and that. Child's Play and Fright Night. He's got a, a new movie came out, too, right really? now. Really? What is it? It's called Rock, Paper, Scissors. Okay. I like that and, name. Yeah, it's 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 uh, it's out right now, and they've been trying to blast it out, and that you know, I think yeah. it's it's uh, they got Michael Madison in it, and the very first Jason Voorhees. I forget his name. Already uh, <laughs> flanking on it as well. I can't remember, but he was the very first Jason. You know, when he yeah. was a kid, he jumped mm -hmm. out. Yeah, but he's in it as well. I worked with the second one. I yeah, think. but you got Moran. A, Okay. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Tony Moran, I believe his name was. Some of these people, they think, 
oh, I'll just do this movie and, and that's and that's enough. No, no. You, you got to blast it out. I'll never forget there was this uh, actor producer I knew. His name is Ron Pinnell. He mm-hmm. did a very famous martial art film called No Retreat, No Surrender with Jean Claude Van Damme. Mm-hmm. It was a huge success. Right. And Jean Claude Van Damme went on to be a star and he didn't. I said, Ron, what, what happened? Why didn't you go on? Yeah. And he said, I had a big ego at the time. I thought I was the star of the movie, I had this big hit, and they'd yeah. all come to me. Jean Claude Van Damme was smart. He then got never heard of Ron Parnell. No, I'm sure, and, and you're a movie buff, <laughs> yeah. and I'm sure you you probably remember the movie, but mm-hmm. not him. And he never hi- hired a uh, Van Damme. Immediately got himself a publicist, a manager, an agent, and he pushed it, and that's how he went on. And I think, um, and, and a lot of people don't realize that, like. You know, Tom Hanks works a lot because Tom Hanks is a really nice guy. Exactly. Yes, I think you that know, helps people too. People want to work with Tom Hanks because he's a nice guy. And he seems like he'd be stable too. Yeah, uh, as opposed to, um, you know, I don't know him, so I don't care. But Val Kilmer is supposed to be a little, you know, wacko. <laughs> Why you, know, you learn a lot about people from yeah. open bars. Yeah. I hate to say it. <laughs> Some of them, their egos and being difficult mm-hmm. can destroy their career. Look at Steven Seagal. You yeah. know, he, he they said everybody says how unpleasant he was. Mm-hmm. Exactly, that's and, another good example. Or, or there was another one. Um, what was his name? This is way dating. It, uh, Don Redberry. He did uh, the Red Rider movies. Oh, oh yeah, yeah, okay. Um, they used to call him the cowboy James Cagney mm. but he was a brilliant actor he was fantastic a great actor but he was so difficult on the set that nobody wanted to work with him yeah. mm. and his career went downhill yeah. it's a shame you, you, yeah. you, it's, it's like you said it's a combination of things you've got to be a great actor but you also have to be a good person as well and a good business person networking skills and then like I said business. blasting yeah. exactly I want to be Jim Cameron because he's supposed to be just a nightmare to work with but oh was, really but yeah oh he's supposed to be horrendous but on oh, the yeah, other end, they do takes like a million times. Oh, or something. He's, he's known to just, I mean, like Ed Harris. Uh, so is you. David Fincher. David Fincher's supposed to be tough too. Yeah, yeah. don't they do takes like a million times? Oh, I don't know about that. I, I just know like Cameron is is like, it, people work with him, and and like Ed Harris says, I'll never talk to this guy ever again. Oh my god! You know, I mean, because he's so relentless and so hardworking, and, and and he apparently never sleeps, and um, oh, but. People still do end up working with him because he's so great. You know, yeah, he's <laughs> so, so I'm saying it's like he's a jerk. But Made he, such iconic movies. Yeah. yeah. Oh yeah. 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 So, but uh, um, who, who who have you worked with is, that would say is like been the most fun to work with? A director, actor. You know, I think. Um, well, I will say Richard Tyson was quite an experience, yeah. especially because I love the Buddy Ravel character, yeah, yeah. and I loved his work in Kindergarten Cop and just you know, Black Hawk Down and you something know, about Mary. Something Keep about in. Mary. I mean, he had a show. I forget the name of it. It was on TV where there were these two cops. I'm gonna call, I, I want to say the name was like Hot Rod or something. Or there were two cops, and like he had like this was the '80s, so he had long hair, and then there was like a you know central casting version of like you know the by the book cop or detective. <laughs> and God, what was the name of the show? And it was such a good show. And I was like, that was such a good show. And he's like, you're dating yourself. That was a long time ago. I was like, I saw it in reruns. And he's like, yeah, it only lasted like two seasons. But um, just seeing him in that cop show was wonderful. And uh, working with him was a great experience. I really enjoyed working with Mindy Kaling because it really empowered me as a woman and mm-hmm. as a minority. What, what was the project you worked on? It was the Mindy Project. It oh, was the, the Mindy it Project. It was the okay. pilot of the oh, Mindy the Project. Okay. Yeah. So they, so she was the executive producer. She was the lead. She was the director. Mm-hmm. She was the writer. To see a woman and to own it and to be involved with yeah. it and to see like you know the getting notes from the network and she was totally cool with it and our director was Charles McDougal and he directed the pilot for Sex in the City he directed like all the big pilots and he's an interesting character he's very British mm-hmm. and so he had and he would like come to set on his bicycle and I was like wow this guy is something but you know she held her own with men that were much older than her and mm-hmm. that was a very empowering experience working with Harley Wallen was wonderful he's such a creative person he's so talented he's does so many things he's a world-renowned Swedish martial arts champ Mm -hmm. so he's got a really good work ethic he's also very creative and uh, also working with another great director uh, Dustin Ferguson is amazing Mm -hmm. Uh, he's a big cult filmmaker and very talented guy and he's made like 70 feature films and his mind is so creative and he is like a you know his own uh, IMDb, human IMDb. He mm. knows so much about movies. So I'm always learning something from, from right. all these people. So it's just been a great experience. 
Also, uh, in terms of voiceover, I really enjoyed working with Dominic Polcino. I told you about him mm -hmm. earlier. He directed The Simpsons, Family Guy, King right. of the Hill, and his whole family, they're all in animation, his brothers, so the Polcino brothers. So mm -hmm. that was a great experience, you know, him uh, you know, directing my session in the booth for that film I worked on, Love Sick Fool, and I voiced a bunch of characters. That was an amazing experience. That Fred Willard, Lisa Kudrow, Janine Garofalo, right. that was wonderful. Um, that was my best, definitely my best voiceover experience. But yeah, lots of wonderful experiences with great people. I love working with Mel Novak, especially when um, there's like an action scene because he um, protects me because he kind of tells me, okay, don't fall this way. I worked on a horror film with him. Mm -hmm. Fall that way. And like, you know, he saved me a lot of physical therapy visits and <laughs> chiropractor visits. And, you know, also great, you know, to watch him as an actor. He does a lot with his eyes. But also in terms of like protecting myself, it's mm -hmm. great working with him. And like, yeah. you know, the director was like, I defer to you, Mr. Novak. So yeah. that was a wonderful experience working with Mel as well. Just working with really good seasoned actors you, is a wonderful experience. Is it, is it uh, as far as acting goes, I mean, do you prefer film only or would you do, do you like theater or do you, uh, you said you've done voiceover. Uh, is there a genre that you, uh, uh, or a part of, of acting that you prefer to do the most? Is it film, is film what you want to do the most? Film is very exploratory. I really did like theater, but I will tell you after the YouTube age, because I was an improviser mm -hmm. and I did sketch comedy, like a lot of that stuff is online now. And I feel like when people perform, I mean, not, not everybody, I'm a UCB alum. Mm -hmm. I, I went through UCB, which I don't know if your viewers are familiar with. Um, Underground comedy play. Yeah, um, upright, com upright, upright citizens. I, 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 I'm sorry, comedy. yes. Okay. I, no I worries. And it was started by um, Amy Poehler was right, one right. of them from SNL and a couple of her, Matt Walsh and a bunch of them, and they're incredible. But what I've noticed, I mean, UCB is great, but what I've noticed with improv is because it's recorded now mm -hmm. and sketches, like you're supposed to be like out of your head. Mm -hmm. Well, sketch, I guess you can be in your head, but I feel like since everything is recorded now, it's like people play to the camera. Mm -hmm. Whereas in improv, you're supposed to be like it's supposed to be like a community thing it's right. like a it's like a group thing mm -hmm. so it's it kind of you kind of steer away from the naturalness of it mm -hmm. to like okay well this is going to go on YouTube and this is going to go on a popular channel or this is like a well-known improviser right. who's on television so you know I got to be my you know mm -hmm. hammiest or whatever where it takes away from the group building performance sure, yeah. and what long form is which is what you know Del Close created mm -hmm. so Theater has really shifted for me, and I'm sure there's different places. I'm sure you know that it's not like that, but I think in the medium of film, you're allowed to be more exploratory. Mm -hmm. Whereas TV is kind of like God, it's like slow moving, really, just to do a scene where you're like walking down the hallway and saying mm -hmm. hello to somebody. It takes that long, really. Yeah. So it kind of takes away from the creativity of it. But I really do enjoy, enjoy film. It's more exploratory, okay. not as much as theater. But then again, theater has kind of shifted for me, as I said, because I was an improviser yeah, for so long. Yeah, yeah. Joe, what about you? I mean, do, would you prefer, um, if you had your choice, of doing indie stuff? I mean, or would you rather work with the studio if you had the opportunity? I mean, not that you haven't had the opportunity, but I mean, would you rather do a big, big film? Or would you rather have, you know, uh, work on the indie projects? It, it depends. You know, I don't like to limit myself. Yeah. You know, um, yes, I do like the creativity of the indie films. Yeah. Um, you know, with the the only problem with the big studio, you know, it's a great artistic outlet yeah. you know the, the, on the one side you know gives you you're more uh, uh, a ch chance to you know get a film out there that the big studios normally wouldn't wouldn't run mm -hmm. you know wouldn't put out there because it's the big studios you know they're uh, unless it's like a Marvel movie or something like that they're just gonna want to put it out there so it kind of stifles your artistic view yes although there's a lot more money be made on mm -hmm. there yeah but at the end you sell your soul because you're not allowed to be a, as an artist yeah um, and plus that too it's easier to get um, you know there uh, one thing about the indie films is it's easier to get like uh, a green, they'll take a chance it's like Roger Corman on Death Race mm -hmm. 2000 yeah the, uh, a movie like that, a big studio would have never, you know, uh, given green light. They wasn't going to invest all the, uh, risk so much money on it mm -hmm. being green lighted. But uh, indie film, you know, when it's less money involved, of course, yeah. it has a greater chance of being green lighted. Yeah. yeah. And, uh, and, and and like I said, it, it, indie films it gives you more of a chance to um, get things out there that normally wouldn't get out there. Right. But uh, as the question, though, like I said, it's it's. it's 
I like a happy medium. Naturally, it has you know you have to be accountant, of course, too. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, you have to be an artist, so it has to be like half and half. Yeah. Um, but like I said, it's 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 uh, they both have their pros and cons. Like I said, sure. that's where the money is. The big studio films. Um, with indie films, it's more of artistic. Yeah, you know, you, you well, I, I suppose that you know, like, I mean, would you would you want to play a character in the Marvel Comics universe? If I you would love to. to. Yeah, I would love to. Yeah, I, 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 would, I would assume that you know a lot of people. It's a lot of working out, though. But sure. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> a lot of protein. <laughs> I saw that girl Brie Larson move that SUV. I don't know if I could do that. <laughs> Maybe I don't know for the right price. But I mean, it it does. I mean, the paychecks that you get allow you to. Go off and, and with the name and that recognition and the paychecks will allow you to go off and do indie projects or whatever you want, exactly. which is what Clooney did. You know, after he did that yes. horrendous Batman and Robin movie, yes, uh, he said, you know, it, okay, now I can, I've got enough money, I can wa do what I just want. Very profound political yeah. movie. You know, I know, like um, Peter Lorre, for instance, mm -hmm. Hollywood just kept on wanting him to play the same kind of role over and over yeah. again. And he said, you know, that's like he was doing these popular films, Mr. Moto. Mm -hmm. And uh, um, it was a very popular franchise for, I think, 20th Century Fox. And Peter Harvey said, you know, I came to Hollywood to be an actor, mm -hmm. not to be uh, Mr. Moto. Right. And although at the end, Peter Harvey just gave up and he just played the roles that Hollywood wanted him to, yeah. even though he felt it stifled his artistic view. It, there was an... But, you know... I mean, he's a great actor, yeah, too. Yeah, but, I mean, it, 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 it's interesting that you bring that up because it is like... Uh, Particularly with Marvel and, and, and Disney and uh, pretty much owning everything now, um, it, it, the studios are evolving back into what they were 70 years ago, where they're mm. controlling the projects more so than even the directors or producers are. Yes. Uh, mm. I think Edgar Wright, when he was doing Ant-Man, had a problem with that with the Marvel people. And I, I, I heard an interview with John Favreau talking about when he first directed Iron Man that, you know, like he directed the the scenes with the characters but you know like the action sequences were already laid out you know he had to work on the script based on what Marvel already wanted to do you know uh, and and that seems to be kind of what's happening now a lot with the, the larger studios when you say uh, when you, uh, yeah, you know, yeah it's, uh, uh, you've got to bend your will quite a bit to work with the major studios and what they want to do so um, let's talk about this premiere uh, I'm, yes I, if we're lucky um, and my editor's fast, and we're going to get this up before the premiere. Um, let, let's hope so. Uh, the fingers name is, crossed. Uh, yeah. Fingers crossed. Uh, the name of the movie is called Eternal Code. Eternal Code, directed by Harley Wallen. And, and, and give us uh, give us the log line on the story. What is the story? Wow, um, it's based on an article that Harley read about in China where they're doing head transplants. Okay. So they take that theme mm -hmm. and the ramifications of you know, being somebody else, like putting yourself in somebody else's body. Actually moving the head onto another body. Yeah, but this is like a, well, I don't know how much it's, I can give away, but... Uh, uh, it's like a, a program chip where you can download. Oh, okay. Yes. I gotcha, I gotcha, okay. And you can just get into another body. So, you know, with all the billionaires out there, mm -hmm. this could be a good thing or it could be a bad thing. Like, uh, it's more about, I like the psychological ramifications of this and the right. societal and the sociological ramifications, which without getting into too much detail, Harley certainly explores. Like, this is for like, uh, it's like a caste system almost where the wealthy can, you know, get yeah. ownership of the poor and, mm -hmm. you know, get into another body so uh it's very it's a very interesting take on you know somebody that's as well read as harley to, to discover something like this and i play a scientist nikita okay and there's a lot of uh moral questions brought up yeah know, lots like, like, of moral questions you know and socioeconomic issues mm -hmm. yeah so and uh so it's, it's, it's and it's so like i said it's a, a great action suspense thriller and it's a, and and, and, uh, and there's a lot of great action scenes there and a lot of uh, great performances and it's 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 a lot of twists and turns. Mm -hmm. You know, is it one of those films that you can watch and you can get, you know halfway through it know what's going to happen at the end? Is it? Uh, and this is uh, premiering at the Ch at the Chinese next week. Yes, September fourth. Mm -hmm. September fourth at the Chinese. Have you been to a premiere like that at the Chinese before? Uh, last year, Harley had a premiere for okay. this film, Betrayed, and it was you know Joe did an amazing job. So no, it was fantastic. This mm -hmm. one we're really excited about. There's there's going to be a lot of celebrities coming. International uh, press. Uh, the, we have some Academy Award nominees. Nice. Uh, uh, we have some primetime Emmy winners. We have uh, Gil Bellows from the Shanghai Redemption. Uh -huh. He's coming. Uh, Jake Busey is supposed to be coming. He was there last year. Uh -huh. he's, uh, he's coming again. 
and then uh, 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 Terry Moore, who's nominated for a Cambly Award, she's she's going to be coming mm-hmm. as well. We have the former mayor of Beverly Hills, two-time mayor of Beverly Hills, Jimmy Dalshad, who's okay. also a family friend. We have uh, Grammy winner Omar Akram is coming. He's an international artist, international legendary artists Andy and Shani will be there. Andy Madadian and Shani Rigsby, yeah. Navid Negapon, who is uh, one of the leads in Aladdin. Okay, he played the Sultan. We have amazing actors there. We're just really excited. Honored, floored. Richard Grieco. Uh, Richard Fana, Grieco. Richard yeah. Grieco will be there. So it'll be an exciting year. Deborah Reed, she was there last year. She's yes. uh, coming as well again this year. Like I said, it's still, uh, uh, Don the Dragon Wilson, uh, okay. Okay. Uh, okay. Yeah. martial art champion, yeah, yeah. kickboxer. He's going to be there as well. It's, it's going to be like a night of 100 stars. Now, I'm curious, if just on a on a backstage, behind the scenes kind of thing, like when you do a premiere at, at the Chinese, do you like rent the, the theater out and, and, and put the project on? Or what, what happens exactly? How does that, how is, how is a premiere at the Chinese arranged? Uh, do you know what I mean? Um, uh, a lot of arrangements. I mean, no, I mean, does, does the Chinese uh, select what they do premieres for, or do does someone reach out and say we want to do a premiere there? Or? Yes, we submit for a premiere. Uh, uh, if they, you know, if they look at the project, if mm-hmm. it meets their standards, then we're allowed to have a premiere there. And this okay. film is also going to have a limited theatrical run. It's going to be playing in, um, I believe, over twelve different uh, Minneapolis, Minnesota, and Michigan, Chicago, Phoenix, cities across the country. So through Imagine it, Theaters with an E. Uh, <laughs> yeah, it's going to have a limited uh, theatrical release, so we're super excited about that. And then it's, uh, afterwards, of course, it'll be released on the other uh, uh, outlets, such as VOD and, and, and mm-hmm. Walmart, Best Buy. Yeah. And Harley said that there was more interest, right? Uh, yeah, there's more theaters actually uh, expanding, so nice. like I said, so we're super excited with this film. Mm-hmm. Is, uh, is this the biggest project uh, you guys have been involved with, or, I mean, as far as films go? or uh, it's, uh, it's definitely one of the top... It's getting there. Yeah. yeah. It's, it's definitely is, I'd say. It probably will be after the premiere. <laughs> That's what I'm thinking. No, like I said, we're super excited. Um, it, it, Vita gives a great performance in oh, it. Thank she, you. She, well, I had a, a great, you know, director, a great cast, great crew. You know, Harley's uh, amazing, and it's it's like I said, it's 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 uh, I'm super excited about it. And, Me uh, too. And uh, I think I'm really. It's one of those movies that people's going to think about it. Okay, now, I agree. And it's still entertaining at the same time. What is uh, what what? I guess, I, I, why, do you, why are you an actor? What, what is it about being an actor that you enjoy? You know, I always felt very, this is going to sound strange, but we do have an hour. I always felt very different and removed for people. I had a very interesting childhood in that it was after the Iranian Revolution. And at one time, well, not at one time, but like over 40, 50 people lived in my house. So um, not at once. I mean, it was a much bigger house. Mm-hmm. <laughs> my parents were much better off then. But like we had all these people come, and I remember sometimes we'd go to the airport two, three times a day. So my parents were very embroiled with these people, like right. helping them set up a lifestyle, mm-hmm. and, and you know, it was like a very. You really saw the human condition because I remember a lot of these people were like you know ambassadors or you know CEOs, and you know they were humbled by coming to my parents' house, and then. So my folks were so busy with that is I was, what would I do? I'm a kid in suburban Maryland. I would just watch television. Mm -hmm. And then on the weekends, I'd be like, please let me go to the movies. Drop me off to like, you know, the Bethesda Metroplex or whatever Mm -hmm. movie theater was around back then. So my whole world was TV and movies. Um, It was, there was a lot of anti-Iranian sentiment. Uh, uh, luckily, I'm fair complected, but with a name like Vita Ghaffari in Maryland, you kind of stand out. You know, there's like, People like Muffy and Todd and Chad, and <laughs> it's a very country club place where I grew up with. I don't know if Kentucky's like that. I would imagine nice hats, but um, you know. So I think I was always, I always felt like an outsider, yeah. and I think the mediums of film and television was like my everything. Like I would yeah. watch like Carol Burnett reruns. I had an old dad. I would watch I Love Lucy reruns. Flip Wilson. Like I wasn't like other kids. You yeah. know what I mean? Like I was. I mean, I'm not into movies as much as Joe is. I'm not as smart as he is, but like, I just loved TV and movies so much, and yeah. I love the character's journey, and I love expressing myself through a character. And I feel like where I went to school, um, they really promoted writing, but not really acting. I went to I went to the pub- first. I went to a private school, and then when things got really rough, I went to a public school. But 
they always encouraged us to write, and we would we would perform what mm -hmm. we had written. Right. But it was never like, and I even got into performing arts magnet schools, but my parents didn't want me to be in a bus for two hours each way. So, <laughs> you know, I'm still doing this stuff. But you know, it's it's funny. I think I just it was just being an outsider, and I feel like being an outsider, I got to observe a lot of things. Sure. And as an artist, one observes. And even though I am from the D.C. area and it's a political place, we have the most amount of theaters there per capita besides New York and Chicago. Interesting. So as a kid, like I would go to the Kennedy Center and not just for school trips, like my mom would take me there or my sister would take me there. So I feel like I had a very interesting upbringing. Uh, my family, they're all educators. My mom was a teacher. My sister teaches. My dad was a professor. So I feel like they would take me to the theater. Like I'd be like, no, I'd rather go to the movies. But like they would take me to like the Shakespeare theater. Mm -hmm. So I feel like I was exposed to a lot of that as a kid growing up. Right. And I did do a little bit of performing arts in summer camp or whatever. But mm -hmm. since my math, my dad was a mathematician and scientist, he forced me to go to math camp. And I'd be like, okay, I'll go to math camp, but you have to let me take the theater curriculum in the afternoon. So I had a little bit of an exposure to that as a kid, mm -hmm. but more from like. Because it's back east, this is like a different story. It's like everything is like on writing. Right. As yeah. here, it's more performing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so. I, I found that to be the case too. Yeah. Um, what about you, Joe? Why Why are you involved in the film industry? What is it about film that makes you want to be, you know, do what you do? I feel it's, uh, you know, there's many different forms of art. You mm -hmm. know, there's music, there's painting, and, and then there's film, of course. Mm -hmm. And, and uh, you know, I feel it, it, it lets my, uh, I consider myself an artist, and it lets my artistic view get out there, too. Yeah. And, uh, you know, it's like what Vito was talking about. It's funny how a uh, famous saying, um, a friend of mine's told me, Julia Diller, Phyllis Dillard's uh, mm -hmm. daughter-in-law, once said, was that art is a great escape from the harshness of reality. And mm. it is a great escape for people to get away when they're going yeah. through trials. And I know I've went through quite a few trials, and my favorite thing would be to, you know, go get away from it, you know, watch yeah. something for a couple hours. Yeah. And um, and it's a great artistic, you know, it's, it's you know, outlet to be, uh, get it released. You know, and it, it, what I love too is, like when we get released in like a Chinese theater and there's so much classic old Hollywood there. You yeah. just think of all other films that were played there. Yeah. You know, that's like the, uh, there was a film festival we was at not too long ago, we, um, the Nollywood Film Festival. Mm -hmm. uh, I remember you was going to come but you got tied up, I yeah. think. But at the theater it played, you know, I just love the history. Yeah, you know, Bootsy like, Collins performed there, Ice-T performed nice. there. It, it's funny, and I've seen all these classic pictures and, and uh, like Ray Milland, uh, not one of, it was one of, it was, the Ray Milan downhill years, but still, it was a cult classic. It was Ray Milan worked with Billy Wilder, so yeah. you know, I mean, it was a movie he did called Frogs. I don't know if you remember that one or not. No, <laughs> it was from the seventies. It was one of them, uh, but it played at that theater, and then they had like the Ten Commandments. And you just think. You know, my movie is going to be playing at this same theater. Right. Yeah, and I'm going to be fangirling because a lot of people that I'm a fan of are going to. I'm a fan of all of them, but like Lydia Cornell from Too Close for Comfort, I used to watch those reruns, and I would try to style my hair like her. She's coming to our premiere. Oh, so nice, nice. It's exciting to see. And Richard Grieco, I loved him in his eyebrows as a teeny bobber. <laughs> I shouldn't age myself, but as a, as a young child, as a young lassie, so Very it'll be cool. exciting. Well, uh, let's. Uh, we're going to wrap up here, but uh, I, 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 the movie's called Eternal Cold. Yes. And, and if, if, can anybody come to the premiere, or do you have any invitation? What? How does that work? We're at capacity, aren't we? Yes, unfortunately. Nice. Yeah, it was uh, unfortunately. Uh, uh, right now, we are we are overbooked on it. Mm -hmm. Beyond but, capacity. But it's going to be playing at uh, theaters all over the nation. Okay. And uh, so, the, please go to the theaters and come check it out, and you'll love the movie. I'm sure of it. And then, uh, and then, it, uh, like I said, it's going to be playing theaters all over in Arizona. Uh, it's going to be playing in uh, Chicago, it's Minneapolis, be... Minnesota, and Michigan. Just lots of great Phoenix, lots of great markets. Yeah, it's going to be premiering when, Vita, uh, nationwide? August 30th, mm -hmm. and then our premiere in, in Hollywood is September 4th, and then VOD and other platforms is September 6th. Yeah, first it's going to premiere like in um, Chicago, uh, Michigan, and a few theaters over there. Uh, the thirtieth, yeah, and then the West Coast. And then it, uh, was it the fourth? The or, fourth is the West Coast premiere. It's going to be premiering over in New York and all over the place. Yeah, we're, we're very Arizona. excited. Are we going to see Joe in a black tie? Oh, uh, I'm, I think he will. Yes, yes, yes. Nice. Uh, Reluctantly for him. <laughs> <laughs> and then, and then uh, Vita, Vita also has a couple other films. She just finished this. Yes, um, I just did Los Angeles Shark Attack. It was my third scientist role. Lo Los Angeles Shark Attack. Yes, okay. a Dustin Ferguson's film, and it's from the 
POV of the shark, and I worked with some great. Really? Yeah, like the, the I'm, like I'm ruining their habitat, you know. Yeah, okay. So Dustin's very sensitive. So uh, Brink Stevens from Slumber Party Massacre, Maria uh, Brink Olson. Stevens. Oh, Brink Stevens is incredible working with her. And then uh, Donna Lee Heising, who's mm -hmm. a great screen queen, and of course Mal Novak. And, and I'll tell, uh, tell you, one of Roger Corman's guys. Alan Maxson was one of the heads in Godzilla, King of the Monsters who, of Kingdom War. And who was the one shooting it again? Chuck Zito, Vita? Chuck Zito is amazing because he's not Chuck Zito. It's Chuck Serino. Chuck Serino. Get your yeah, Italians sorry. together. He did Chopping Mall. He worked on Chopping Mall. I remember he, Chopping Mall, yeah. Yeah, he did a, a lot of famous films with Roger Corman. He's the DP. He's the a DP and he was incredible. It was a great experience working with all of them. I also did another film of Dustin's, Robo Woman. I once again played a scientist. Again, Robo Ro Woman. Robo Woman. What is that about? It's a kind of like a... Charles Bronson y revenge tale. It's a woman's empowerment movie, which is perfect after the post Me Too era. And Donna Lee Heising is amazing. Once okay. again, we have Brink Stevens, Mel Novak, just a great, great cast. I don't know if you remember Sue Price from the Nemesis. Yes, Sue Price uh, from the Nemesis uh, franchise. Nemesis, Albert Pine, you know, Albert Pine, he did uh, uh, Mean Guns and he did uh, a lot of famous movies from the 90s. He did Cyborg with Jean Claude Van Damme. I remember Cyborg, yeah. Yeah. When he did these popular Nemesis films with Sue Price. Sue Price, okay. uh, Nemesis. Two to uh, five. five. Yeah, she started. And I also uh, was just recently cast as the mysterious and allure, alluring Cassandra in uh, Realm of Shadows opposite Tony Todd, which is a tremendous honor. I love the Candyman franchise. Man. Tony Todd's great actor. Final Destination. Yeah, so I'm very, very Man. much looking forward also, to that. Also, Tony Todd uh, 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 played Worf's brother on uh, Star Trek Next Generation. So. Yes, yes. So. <laughs> yeah, it's a resume and uh, the Flash. Uh, CW Flash TV series. He was a voice for the. Uh, oh, was that? Was that his voice? Yes. Oh, okay. Okay. He's incredible. He's yeah, an incredible I can't voice. Wait. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. And but I, I you know, uh, I always loved him as Candyman. Candyman. Yeah, yeah I love a Candyman. So, Joe, what is your advice for someone who wants to make it in the industry? And Vita, I want to, want to get that from you as well. I always say, do your homework. You know. Uh, Look um, people up on IMDb. Yes, there's so many producers <laughs> out there, and everybody in Hollywood's a producer, and there's so many of them that says, they'll waste your time. Scams. And, yeah, scams. Look them up. Oh, you're a producer? What have you done what I know? Go mm -hmm. to YouTube. Check out the trailers. See who they work with. Yeah. You know, information is king. IMDb is a wonderful thing. Mm -hmm. They'll Once you cut so many of the fake people out, they'll... You know, increase your chances. Okay. Uh, and then, of course, you know, work at your craft. And network, you know, and and and, and uh, those are the things. Like I said, always do your homework because there's a lot of people out there. Oh, my producer, or this or that, and 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 you look and they're just wasting your time or trying to rip you off in that. Yeah. And what about you, Vita? Well, I agree with him as well, but. Uh, coming more from an acting POV, I think now anybody can record an audition on an iPhone. Mm -hmm. So I think it's good to be prepared. I hate it when people say, "Oh my God, I had all these self tapes. Why would I do that?" I mean, mm -hmm. you have to record yourself. You know, you have yeah. to put yourself out there. I think you know people find you on social media. You can find about castings now. It's a whole different you know ball of wax. Get mentors. You know, build relationships in the community. Network, of course. But I think an actor has a lot more power now with a with an iPhone or even a Droid or anything mm -hmm. or an iPad. You could there's so much you can do now. There's you can so do a much podcast with an you iPad. can do a podcast. It's, a, it's a ridiculous all that you can do. Like you said, there's so many options. Yeah. You Network, just have to be on top of things. Networking's important. Look at Dick Miller. Mm -hmm. Oh, the great uh, Dick Miller. Joe Dante put him in about 20 movies. He put him on wow. in almost Lucky every single Dick film Miller. he uh, made. Dick Miller, by the way, just one of those kind of faces and voices that you just always recognized him and everything he did. Uh, uh, I think, well, I can't remember the character's name, but he was in the Gremlins film. He was the guy that kept screaming, there's a Gremlin! And the Gremlins too. That was a movie with probably uh, most famous thing, but I always liked him in A Bucket of Blood. Bucket of Blood, That's yeah. A good and name. A Little Shop of Horror. And I, and, uh, see, this is, I, I can remember him from different films. He's in The Terminator. Chopping, Chopping uh, Mall. Yeah, Chopping Mall. And Terminator, he's the one that sold the guns to Arnold Schwarzenegger. Then Arnold Schwarzenegger shoots him. Yes. The film. So, uh, it just popped up all the time in the, in the movies. Just really remembered Dick the great Dick Miller. I'll tell you a funny story you might get a kick out of. Yeah. Uh, the director, Jim Wyzuki, is it? Wyrnowski. Wyrnowski. He was a, a big Roger Corman guy. He was doing that movie, Chopping Mall, with uh, mm -hmm. Dick Miller. And Jim, I think he was doing a lot of drugs at the time. Yeah. He was very vocal and violent. 
and he screamed at, uh, 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 or he, he says he didn't scream, he shouted at, or said something to Dick Miller. Dick Miller said, I'm never going to work for you again, and he never, never did. He never did another movie for him after that. Really? Interesting, interesting. All right, well, we are going to wrap up. Um, I, Eternal Code is the name of the film. Yes. Look for it. Uh, the premiere is next week, uh, September 4th, if you guys want to go watch a red carpet kind of thing um, and then it, it look for it on video on demand and, and different formats in and the next be, month or so and it's going to be playing in theaters uh, what's the theaters over in Michigan uh, imagine with an E theaters in Michigan and Chicago uh, Chicago and Minneapolis Minnesota and Phoenix Arizona all across the country okay and then uh, and, Denver and, and then like you said uh, please check me out on IMBD and, yes and I'm on the Facebook as a Williamson Management and IMBD too and please Ch- uh, check Vita's pages out on uh, Facebook. Follow Facebook, all her latest Instagram, projects. Instagram, Twitter is my name, Vita Gafari, V I D A G H A F F A R I. Now, I usually have people uh, uh, close out with uh, a couple of things. First question is, Vita, do you have any tattoos? No, never. I'm an East Coast nerd, okay. Mid Atlantic nerd. Uh, Joe, what about you? No, no, no tattoos. I'm a nerd too. Okay. I'm not cool enough, I guess. All right. Uh, I need. Well, so you're the actress, so let's uh, let's put it on you. I need your best evil villain laugh. God, it's gonna be so can so hammy. <laughs> good, good. What about you, Joe? Can you do it? Uh, I can't. Let me see. Uh, <laughs> I like that one too. <laughs> Thank you. And I need a joke. Either one of you got a joke for me? God, that's tough. Um, hey, you, you did improv for comedy. Come on. <laughs> <laughs> dun, 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 dun. <laughs> oh, he's the king of hammy jokes, though. Okay. This one. Okay. Let me see. Um, I've been trying to think of one, but I can't think of one offhand. You have so many hammy jokes. Come on. Um, let me see. Uh, <laughs> you caught me on that spot. Yeah, you caught me on uh, that spot. I can tell you funny, impressed. cool stories, but I. Uh, uh, yeah, me too. But I can't think of any. Um, uh, any jokes offhand? Um, Nothing. Let me then see. You have okay, to, uh, then you have me, to rap. Uh, you have to, like I don't know. Your your jokes are kind of crass. Uh, uh, <laughs> it's all right. I'm trying to think. I can't think of one. Vita, you're the. You I can't one. think of one either. You're putting me on the spot. My mind's on eternal code. <laughs> <laughs> I'm trying to think uh, uh, of one. Um, I'm trying to think of all the Tim Conway movies I've seen in Don Knox, if I could think of one there. Oh, wait, I got it. I got it. I, uh, I'm going to steal a joke from one of my favorite uh, 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 comedians of all time, Hank okay. Garrett, from okay. Car 54 Warrior. Okay. Why is it Jewish men get circumcised? Oh, my God. I knew it was going to be a cross joke. Do you know why? <laughs> why? Because Jewish women won't touch anything unless it's half off. Oh! oh. That's so wrong on so many levels. Oh lines. my god! No, hey, hey, I'm stealing it from Hank Garrett. He's Jewish, and he and he he performed at the Sam. Although I'm not uh, Hank Garrett. Uh, send all complaints to JoeWaitOnze at Gmail dot com. God, I'm trying to think of like a good ha- laser hair removal joke, but I can't. I can't top this. <laughs> All good, all good fun, folks. Yeah. <laughs> well, Joe, Vita, I, I, I appreciate you uh, coming on the show. It's an inter- interesting conversation, just talking yes. about the industry in general. And uh, I wish you much luck with the tournament. Thank you so and, much. And your other projects, I'll definitely be looking for it. Um, and Joe, same for you. Um, I, you. Good luck with uh, with uh, some of the projects you're working on, and uh, you know. Thank you so much for having us. It's greatly appreciated, and I hope you'll come to our, one of our next events. I know we'd be honored to have you. Oh, that's very nice of you to say. Shout I'd out from love, Santa Clarita. I'd love to do that. So, okay, guys, we hope you enjoyed the talk. You've been listening to the Talk of Santa Clarita. Listen to us on iTunes, SoundCloud.com, YouTube, and Stitcher. Barring a life event getting in the way, a new podcast is available every Tuesday. Questions, comments, and show ideas can be sent to the Talk of Santa Clarita at gmail.com. You can also call or text us at 661-505-8672. That's 661-505-8672. Follow us on Twitter at The Talk of SC or on Facebook, Instagram, and YouTube at The Talk of Santa Clarita. You can also visit our website by going to www.thetalkofsantaclarita.com. 
This has been a production of Radio Free Santa Clarita Incorporated, a 501c3 nonprofit organization. To donate, go to radiofreesantaclarita.org slash donate. Radio Free Santa Clarita, on the net and on the air, and we're very much aware. Any questions?